Sama Semalam bebas kabuan. Sama serasa. शादी करूंगी लेकिन पहले उसे तलाश करूंगी और मुझे उसे बताना है कि क्योंकि वो नहीं जानता अल्लाह ताला तुम्हें उस तक पहुंचा देगा जब तुम्हारा उससे शादी का वक्त आएगा क्योंकि वो तो हर लड़का होता है
successful evening as I can see. So Tamina is in conversation with Rashid Rahman. Rashid Rahman and Tamina, please come. Welcome to this session. Our guest today needs no introduction. Uh, the clip, film clip that you just saw is a promotional clip for the book that we are going to discuss amongst other things today. And you could see from the audiovisual representation the outlines of the story of the book. It really is a, a remarkable look at an aspect of war and the kind of wars that Afghanistan has been through for the last four decades, which we normally don't connect with. You know, we, we read the news, we publish the news, we broadcast the news, but the human side of the story gets lost somewhere in that muddle. And this is an attempt, and a very successful one in my view, to bring out the human aspect of that tragedy that we call Afghanistan. It's a young girl's story, it's her journey out of Afghanistan, out of war, to Pakistan, what she acquires here as a result, and her journey back. I won't say more, I'll get straight to Tamina Durani, who I'm sure you want to listen to more than me. Tamina, this is a, a very interesting departure from the kind of writing you've done before. I mean, your two very prominent books, first one, My Feudal Lord, and then the novel that you wrote, Blasphemy. That was uh, the exploration of a very different landscape, a personal, cultural, social, 
Um, and uh, you, you shone the light again on an aspect of our culture which lingers. We call it feudalism. <laughs> but this is a departure from that. Now, what led you to this departure? What were your thoughts? Why were you interested in doing a story of this nature and illustrating it? What about uh, the narrated autobiography of Abdul Sitar Eidi? Was Indeed. that a departure? No. That, I think, is a different book again. I mean, from your previous two. Hmm. So clearly, you have embarked on a journey. You know, some people say you had a full life. Others say you had a colorful life. And uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But certainly this journey is of great interest because we would like to hear from you how you embarked on this and what were the, shall I say, twists, turns and departures that you encountered along the way. You see, when I look at my work, I find that when I connect the dots, it's all related to the same thing. It's related to the core issues that our people face and I think they face it in all third world countries, underdeveloped countries, countries where um, the direction to the people is not clear and there's a lot of confusion. So these things breed and they, you know, grow and uh, uh, like a malignant cancer and then eventually you have to deal with them and face them. So whether it was the story of blasphemy or whether it was the story of my feudal lord, uh, whether it was Idisab, because here we are talking about a completely different man to the kind of man I've spoken, to the kind of men I've spoken about in the first two books. And um, here is a man who is not literate, who is, uh, um, you know, um, not exposed to the whole world as the people could in the first two books could have been, but yet there was so much uh, open-mindedness, his relationship with his wife, the work that she did with him that the man can say now that 90% of the success of ED Foundation is because of Bilkis. So there's a, com there's a connection because we're talking about different sides of the same people. And so essentially it's a yes, common vision, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And um, where we talk about the power and the affluence and the influence in the first two stories, we talk about a man who doesn't have that influence or that affluence or that kind of uh, finance. Uh, and yet starts by selling pencils and uh, matchboxes in the street. And today, uh, Eidi Foundation is in a position that it can loan money to Pakistan. Sure. It has invested its money. It has made, uh, it is every 25 kilometers of the country. <clears throat> it is the largest ambulance service in the world. And it is an autonomous body. So we are talking about this man without the influence and the affluence. And yet he was able to create something that is, despite everything else collapsing in the country, and all institutions, as we've seen, being in a mess, ED Foundation has grown. So we are talking about the different distance, I think, between the state and the people. So I'm going back, I think I'm talking about the people. I'm also wondering what I'm talking about. So I'm working it out myself. But we're talking about the people and their leaders. In uh, Happy Things and Sorrow Times, um, we're talking again with something similar to the first three books because we're talking about feelings. Feelings are universal. It cannot be that somebody uh, has a temperature and feels differently to another person or somebody gets a wound and feels differently to another person. So the physical pain and emotional pain is universal. It's the same pain. If my heart is broken and your heart is broken, they'll pain exactly in the same way. Or if I pain for the loss of a dear one and the death or the murder or the 
mutilation of somebody I'm very close to universally and if it happened to anybody whether in America or England or anywhere they would feel exactly the same way as this child felt in Afghanistan so it's a universal um, I think what I'm getting at is in all my work is that there's a universality now, of course uh, what is you know Edi Saab is an icon not only for Pakistan but for the world and we could you know spend all night talking about him yes but I want to return you to Temina Durani okay when you were growing up mm -hmm. I don't think the Durani household uh, from what I know of it and it's not very much I admit did it prepare you for what was to come later? Were there elements in your upbringing that you can trace back, you can look back to and say, okay, this is where actually I began and it's been a consistent journey since? Or is it that quite contrary to the way you were brought up and the kind of girl you were, in later life, that too was a departure for you? That was a complete departure. You got me there. I think uh, the, my childhood was extremely strict and conservative. My father came, comes from Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa, the village is in Char Sada. Um, I mean, just a few furlongs away from Fata. So you can imagine the kind of mindset that he came with. And um, much as, you know, we lived in Lahore or lived in Karachi but I was in a, in the boarding school in the Mari convent um, and did my O levels there which was the end of my formal education so there was that, that was it uh, but again the convent was very strict and uh, a lot of the girls in the convent were also from Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa because it was so you know, strict and so isolated, so the parents felt happy that the girls were locked up. They were safe there. Yes, safe <laughs> and locked up. And uh, so my childhood was, you know... Very different. Didn't teach me anything, really. So we have to ask the question. Except one thing, it did. And I think I felt from very early on in my childhood that I perhaps my heart belonged to the other side. It did not belong to the um, affluent. Something inside me was always wanting to fight for justice. I did not like the way the staff were treated. I did not like uh, the staff to be, you know, without any notice. Imagine sacking somebody from a job without notice. That's what happens to your domestic staff. You don't have to give them a three-month notice or a one-month notice even. You can just sack them so they're suddenly jobless. I found these things paining me even as a child. And uh, then my own life, I think, prepared me for where I came. So now. you had a, some sense of social justice yes. despite yes the traditional conservative yes. upbringing and being a convent girl, yes. okay? Um, we have no prejudice against convent girls, by the way. <laughs> but at what point did you come to a realization that this was not something just as an intellectual exercise, but that you actually wanted to do something in your own way, at your own level, in your own direction, to change things? I remember years ago when Tamina and I first met, she just recently returned from exile. And you tell the story, I think. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> what happened? No, when I, <clears throat> when I decided to come out, when, once I decided to... Um, when was that? Mm, that would when be <laughs> a long time ago. When I decided... Well, when I became independent, when I became independent, yep. when the first book was out, yep. uh, Rashid Rahman was in fact the first person who interviewed me. And I remember the heading of that interview was, I want to be taken seriously. <laughs> and so I'm struggling with that up to now. Take me seriously. 
I think because I was uh, not just a housewife. I was not just a, somebody who penned down a story because I was angry or because I wanted to, to retaliate or take revenge. I, I had a purpose to writing the first book, and uh, Rashid wrote a beautiful interview about me and gave me a lot of confidence and. Well, you've I never looked back since. Reinforced, I mean. yes. And here I am. So. It must have been a very painful exercise to write My Feudal Lord because you were doing the unthinkable and the unacceptable. I mean, you were talking about yourself, your marriage, your circumstances, mm -hmm. and through it, reflect a social reality that we're all familiar with. Was it, was it very difficult? It was more than difficult. I mean, the word difficult. Because you were laying it out on the line. You were laying yourself out on the line, out there in the public space. And I was also very weak at that time. I was very alone. And I was um, certainly not equipped to face the public with a work that was perhaps very futuristic, even in the 21st century. Because, um, well, anyway, you, you know, peop the way we're brought up, we are taught not to talk about ourselves. That's what I mean. <laughs> taught to cover up everything that's wrong about us and always give, um, you know, a right, the correct impression, which is the acceptable expression, impression to people. And this book was absolutely unacceptable. I knew it when I wrote it. And I um, remember that when it first came out, uh, thank God there was not this media. There was just one state-owned <laughs> television. And there were just the news, news uh, the print media. But I remember in the morning waking up the day the newspapers were going to come with the reviews or the announcement of this horrific book. Uh, <laughs> I hid under the duvet and didn't want to come out and didn't want to read a newspaper and didn't want to know anything that anybody had said. So I was very scared. I was not so scared of the consequences of, you know, somebody shooting me down. No, I was scared of the public knowing the truth. Indeed, and I think... Um, and I that's what our main fear is. I think I speak for everyone when I say that it took extraordinary courage to write that book. <laughs> And whatever the reviews, whatever the initial reviews in the Pakistani print media may have said about it, and if I recall correctly, I think they were mixed. Um, subsequently, of course, the book took off. It became an international bestseller. It's been published in many countries, in many languages, and you became a celebrity. Now, celebrity has its own dynamic. Whether you like it or not, whether you seek it or not, you are thrust into the limelight constantly. How was that experience? Was it very difficult to manage? Did you, were you comfortable with it? I mean, you were a, still, despite your, your coming out in the public space, I always found you were a very private person. Very. So what happened? I mean, when you were literally in the spotlight, what was it, what was it like? I still have that problem because I, I continue to be a very private person. I, I can say that I'm very reclusive. You know, I meet very few people. And uh, as most people know, and you know so well as my friend, that I hardly go anywhere. So I'm homebound. Except uh, you go into exile every so often. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that eh, yes. But, um, in the case of the first book, if I became a celebrity or if I, you know, people recognized me or, or as we can say, maybe, okay, I was famous for what? That book was frightening. So I became famous for this book. Look, this is the woman who wrote that book. However... Some would say notorious. Yeah, notorious. And a lot of people thought, Bohat be, be haya aurat ho gai, Bohat be sharam, 
यू नो जिसने सब कुछ लिख दिया अपने जिंदगी के बारे में तो ये फेस करना इस मुल्क में बहुत मुश्किल है बिकॉज आई डोंट थिंक आई एम अ बेहया और बेशरम इन फैक्ट आई वॉज आई थिंक वट पीपल थॉट वॉज डिग्निफाइड made me an undignified person because i had so much to hide and so much to cover and i was i was i was wounded and covering up the wound or let's say i was lame and wasn't allowed to limp now that is very difficult so in um exposing myself like i did i think i be I think I began to respect myself more. I it the book dignified me. It gave me my dignity back because I was now who I was and this is if you don't like me don't meet me. But you were challenging. You don't want to uh, if you don't agree with me don't agree with me. You were challenging all the norms of our society. by publishing absolutely okay. i was yes and obviously there was going to be a reaction particularly from conservative quarters you know we don't talk about these things in public we parda dal dete hain but did international fame help in terms of more acceptability in pakistan for the book and for you interestingly I, it's been now 23 24 years since i wrote my feudal lord 24 years mashallah I think it's taken 24 years for people to accept that it was a good book. It was not a bad book. It was not not a bad thing I did. Um no the it wasn't the international acceptance of the book. It was translated in 39 languages and I found the same issues everywhere. I traveled to promote it. So it wasn't that that gave me this book or me with this book acceptability i think it gave i think it was time it was the 25 years i think it was the consistency that i continued to live by what i said that i stood by what i said that i did not give up writing mm, on subjects that were again controversial in one way or the other I think that my consistency in my uh, not just writing a kiss and tell and walking away into some other world or some other you know country and remaining in my country bringing up my children in this country making them interact with the people who were all thinking oh god who are they and I had a lot of issues bringing up my children because a lot of parents did not want my uh, their children to meet my children Uh, my daughters had a lot of issues in school and um, so we were a little outcast and shobha day said very beautifully i think when she met me uh, many years ago and she wrote in her memoirs that she walked in like a queen in exile <laughs> <laughs> wonderful <laughs> wonderful so i had I've remained in exile. I mean in my own country there has been that and it's come from that time. Then another thing that I think is crucial is that what was the meaning of the book, the price. I think the price of the book that I had to pay, the price I had to pay was not just people I didn't know or what my children were having to face with the Mm, children in school their parents it was my own family because my parents whether it was my uncles aunts maternal paternal they all left me so there was a disowning which was a real disowning it wasn't somebody meeting me on the sneak my mother didn't meet me quietly they actually disowned me for 13 years So I had no family. You people were my family, so you know it, Rashid. So, so let me put it like this: uh. exile is the common yes. thread in your life, whether it is physical yes. or emotional. Yes, you had uh. both. Your journey back, mm. I hope, is complete now or is ongoing. But I'm interested to know whether, when you were writing. 
subsequent books, for instance your novel to begin with, it's a theme not very different from the fact, factually based My Feudal Lord because it explores a similar kind of yeah. social yeah. milieu, culture, society and exposes its dark underbelly, if I may so put it. That too must have earned you, on the one hand, great many plaudits and on the other, great many brickbats. Because again, this is a society which doesn't like being shown the mirror. Yeah. The ugly visage is not acceptable. So what, what was the response to that? To blasphemy. I, I think again they thought I was be sharam and be haya. <laughs> but if they had looked a little deeper, if they had looked a little deeper, they would understand that what I was really writing about was this amazing religion of Islam, which we do not even know. We do not. We, we don't understand Arabic. And therefore we are, and if we, can't, if we can't read, so then we can't even read a translation. That means we just by hearsay are following a religion. The hearsay of the clerics. Yeah, and, and the hearsay of people like the leader of blasphemy, you know, the man, the, the main person in blasphemy. And so it's become like a cult instead of the great religion. Islam and what I was trying to show in that was that how come it happens under our nose how come we all know about it how is it it was so important for me to write that book because if you know that your religion has been distorted and the word of the Quran has been Mm, 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 you know, misused, or misinterpreted, and the work of the prophet has been completely uh, changed into something else. To me, that's blasphemy. Blasphemy is a distortion of the word of the of the Holy Quran and the work of the prophet. Indeed. What could be more blasphemous than that? Indeed. But we allow that. We've allowed it. Since you wrote the book, of course, we have a long way further down that road, yes. as you know. I mean, our blasphemy issue, I won't get into it, but we all know how serious it has become. But then through E.D., you come to our protagonist, whose film we just saw. It's such a poignant story. As I said, it's the human angle which very often gets lost in the din of the news and the war and you know all the rest of it, analyses and all that. This story is not untypical. I'm sure there were many, many children in Afghanistan who went through similar experiences and the traumas as a result. You know, what we don't realize is we see death and we see injury in war. But what we don't see is the inner injury. And I think children and women perhaps are the worst victims of that kind of injury, the trauma that ensues. She goes through nightmares right into her adulthood. So clearly there is some deeply embedded experience there or trauma there. But what is it saying about where Afghanistan is today uh, in the light of you know the, the the history you've sketched, you've done it in microcosm, and yet you know it's telling a story which is much bigger. It's it's typical. It's universal. What is going on? Do you think in Afghanistan? Do you think children like her, women like her, are they going through something better, worse? Have they got something to look forward to? Are they are they looking to a better future? Or, or are we looking down a very deep and dark hole? Well, I think that's up to us now. Because the story that I'm writing begins from the time of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and leads up to the war on terror. So here is a nation where the children have been directly, even if they have survived physically, their wounds are so deep 
Because if your mother and your father and your siblings are butchered and killed in front of you, it's not forgettable. I don't think I would forget it. And uh, I don't think any of us would be able to overcome that kind of pain. Um, so we, uh, those children were ignored at that time. They were neglected. Nobody thought they would grow up. She had to fend for herself. Yes. I'm sure many children did. Most children. And if their parents are with them, they're also fending for children and themselves. So it's really, you know, uh, uh, very difficult. But what I'm trying to say here is that, and it's an interesting time that this book has come out, because we are faced again with the same situation, that after the Soviet occupation, uh, the Mujahideen who were called and summoned from all over the world, the children who were invisible when you go to a war, you go to a war thinking that you're going to a war against a nation, you're going to a war, to a war against soldiers or combatants, so you, you, you just don't think that you're going to war in a, in, where there are also children, they're invisible at that time, so you can you know, throw daisy cutter bombs in them, you can um, drone attack them, but the children that survive, what happens to them? What happened after the Soviet war was that they were abandoned. Nobody thought that they would grow up. They had no choice but to grow up. Survive. They had no choice but to grow up and become adult. But what was the, the child becoming as an adult that grows, a child growing up with hatred, with anger, with uh, hopelessness? Grief. Grief, no, and with nothing to lose really. So what is that child, are you actually expecting that that child is going to become an engineer or a doctor? The child is going to come and, you know, love you? That child is, that child has been uh, psychologically wounded Damn. and now needs a very deep healing to come out of that situation. We are again confronted with the war on terror ending and now the Americans are about to leave. But what are they leaving behind? The same 70% of Afghanistan 70% is uh, in the bracket of 20, 24, 25. They've lived through so many years of this life. Then are they going to love you? Are they going to agree with anything you say? They, are you going to abandon them again? So I am saying, do not leave behind this war like you left the Soviet occupation the children and the women, who to me are the most affected, when the mother and the child. Are you talking about the world? Are you talking about Pakistan? I'm talking about the world. Okay. I'm talking about the world leadership. Yeah. I'm talking about us too, our, our leadership too. That unless we are going to now heal this nation, which is directly spilling into our nation and is already spilled here, and if uh, the people from Waziristan are soon going to be coming, here, people have to leave their country. When there's an operation, they've got to migrate. We've seen it in Swat, we've seen it them uh, the IDPs, I've worked with them. Those are also traumatized people. When you're homeless, when you're suddenly nowhere with your children. So it's not something you can ex leave to these people and expect them to cure it themselves now. And now we yeah, are completely sane. But don't you think the world is turning away? I mean, turning effectively, away. practically turning away yes. and leaving these people to their own devices, as happened in 89, earlier. But the, the important thing for me is not what the world is doing or not doing, what it should be doing. I agree it should be doing it, but I don't see the signs. Um, and yet, your book, despite all the travails that your protagonist goes through, ends on a note of hope. It is a message that says, I have survived, I will survive, I will go forward, I will live my life, 
I will march towards a better tomorrow. That is the resilience of the people of this region. I think the resilience of the Afghans, the resilience, resilience even of the people in Pakistan is huge. It's, it's uh, especially women and children. Especially I, women and children. I think that lets the rulers off the hook, you know, because we are so resilient, so they can just carry on merrily doing whatever no, they're doing. No, no. What I am trying to say now, and I'm working for, and I'm going to start working at, that this is, the war on terror was not a war we made. It was a decision taken by some great minds sitting in some very important places. Now the decision to end the war has also come from there. I am asking them that please give us a solution. It's well, for you to give us a solution. I'm not giving you the solution. I'm not equipped. I don't know how to fix this mess. But you must. You must put your think tank together and you must begin to find out the consequences of this war because it is, there is no question of world peace if they're going to walk off as, as um, irresponsibly as they did after the Soviet occupation. This voice which wants to confront the rulers of the world and bring them to the point that you were talking about, that they must take responsibility, is that voice sufficiently strong? Does it have critical mass or do you think we have a long way to go? I don't think we can afford a long time. It's around the corner and the damage has already been done. So this voice better become strong. This, this, this voice has no choice but to become strong because this is the only time where we can make the world leadership, when I say world leadership I mean ours as well, uh, listen to us because the effectees of their decision are us. It is our children, it is the citizens of this country, citizens of the world. After all, we saw in 9-11 there were no boundaries. So if they can reach there, then we better understand that this is a, a, this is a problem that, that we, can only, we can only reinvent into, into something successful if <clears throat> If, we, if the citizens can put across to them the importance of our safety, our children, our future, because the leaders are dispensable. The people who made the decisions have gone today. There's no Mr. Bush. President Bush is not there. President Musharraf is not there. So the people who made the decisions have gone. They're irrelevant. However, we are relevant. The citizen is relevant. The citizen is here, so our voice has to be stronger than theirs because their period of decision making is short, maximum 10 years, that's not long enough, we are here forever and our children and our grandchildren. So what is our contribution in our lifetime, which is the only time we can contribute, we can't contribute once we are dead, we can only contribute while we are alive. Now our contribution to providing peace and making sure that we leave a safer world or are, we going to, or are we going to go down in history as a people who lived at a time that all this was creative and created and we were passive observers? And or we victims. just came and sat here and victims. and victims? Or are we going to play uh, um, an effective role and if we have to pay, play that effective role the voice of the citizen has to become extremely strong so that it is not only heard it becomes part of the decision making okay this is a good point at which to throw the discussion open to the audience we want to hear their voice questions please no speeches we don't have time for speeches I'll be grateful short to the point Yes. Uh, 
ہوں اور میں ہی موبائل ٹیک ٹیوسٹ ہوں مجھے آپ سے ایک سنپر سوال پوچھنا ہے کہ آپ نے جو بک لکھی محفید اور باہر آج آپ پاکستان کی خواتین کو ازادی کے حل لیا سے کہاں دیکھتی ہیں کہ ان کی ازادی کہاں تک ہے دوسرا میں آپ سے پرسل پسٹر پوچھنا چاہوں گا کہ کیا کبھی میں بزنی فرم باہر لکھنے کی ضرورت نہیں پڑھے گی Want to respond? <laughs> of course. Um, um, I, I think that the women in this country are definitely uh, progressing. I find a great change in them. They're more expressive. I find them much more <clears throat> wanting to become something. Whereas the men in the country, I think, have not evolved so fast as the women have. Because the men are happy being in, because they've been born entitled, with a sense of entitlement. So they want to just be a man. They've got their position. The woman is fighting for that position. She's fighting for that equal spirit, which God in the Quran has said, okay, your spirits are equal. You just diff you have different roles, but you spiritually to aap alag alag nahi ho na. To Allah ke samne to ek ho. So. اس جاؤں کے عورت زیادہ پڑھنے لگ پڑی ہے the girls do much better in their examinations I find that I find that they want to be something they want to do something there's much more ambition and drive in the youth, the girls than in the boys I find that difference as far as آپ کا دوسرا سوال تھا ویسی کتاب تو جی آپ ایک دفعہ زندگی میں لکھ سکتے ہو بار بار نہیں لکھی جاتی ہے میں نے آسکا ایک پیسن پلیز جی یس سر میں ایک لکھ پلیز انٹروڈیوز یور سیلف مائی نیم ایک حادی پال حسین اور میں ایک student of politics, uh, politics, politics and I am in law and I am a human being first and a Pakistani foremost. I am 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 بہت پھر لگوائے سکھائیں اور آئے میں اتنا خوش کریں ہائی سیف وائٹ ہاؤس میں میں آپ سے اس خطیر سے ساتھوں کہ ایم ای رانگ اور رائٹ 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 کہ اس خانی سیم سیچویشن کا حل صرف وائٹ ہاؤس میں ہے بہت تیز نہیں ہے ان کو ضرور کہ وہ آئے میں اتنا خوش کریں پھر ان کو کچھ خونے سکھائیں ایک نومے کی تکرے ترقی کرنے کے سکھائیں کوئی کھیتے بار سکھائیں کچھ ہر کریں ان کو اگرامی کے لئے بار آف کریں تو یہ دہنے سلیشن میں ہوای فاس کر دیں آپ نے صحیح کہا ہے بلکل بکاز وین ٹریل اٹلیسٹ ون ٹریلین ڈالرز بس پینٹ آن دس وار اور اگر یہ چلے جاتے ٹوورڈز بلڈنگ دے انفرسٹرکچر دے ایکانومی اور ہیلنگ آئی تنک انفرسٹرکچر بھی کام نہیں آتی اس لیے کہ آپ بہت ونڈڈ لوگوں کے ساتھ کام کر رہے ہو تو آپ نے جو کہا کہ وائٹ ہاؤس تو یس that's the only super power and when I talk of think tanks and the people who made the war and the people who have now put us in a position that I am absolutely flabbergasted myself that it seems to us now a war between our country is coming in our country now it's become our war their war is their war but there is also a lot of spillover so what's happened here in this period کہ لگ رہا ہے کہ جیسے we are infidels ہم کافر ہیں اس لیے کہ وہ شریعہ مانگ رہے ہیں تو it seems like a war against شریعہ it seems like the constitution against the شریعہ it seems like all of us sitting here and saying no no we don't want your شریعہ are actually having to 
fight back our own religion. So they've put us in a very difficult and a very dangerous situation today. Um, we have to find the way out ourselves, for ourselves. Lekin uske liye mein aapko baat kar rahi hoon ki White House pe bhi asar kis cheez ka hoga? Citizens ka. Agar citizens united honge, if the voice of the citizen is united, there is no government and there is no uh, power that can silence that voice because power even is similar. The power that the, any official position gets is from the citizen. However, once they've got it, then the citizen again becomes a very weak individual and isolated and separate. So, this is very important to do this. Then we will influence it. Yes, madam. Sorry. My name is Sayyid Muzaffar Hussain Shah. My mother is my father and my father. This is a book of the audience. I have heard from the audience. Do we practically all of the people who are sitting here for all the people who are sitting here کچھ اپنا پارٹیسپیشن کر سکتے ہیں کرنا چاہتے ہیں اس یہ پرکٹیکل میکنیزم کیا ہے جس کے لیے ہم سب بولنٹیر لیے آپ کے ساتھ ہوں سیٹیزن تہمینہ برانی جی جان سکتے ہیں میں نے بہت کوشش کی کہ میں اپنے آپ کو ایک عام سیٹیزن کی طرح I was very conscious of the fact that this, my position as a citizen should become strong, not my position that I had married somebody so now I became strong, until he was strong so I was strong, you know. Citizen which means, which is Awam hai, اس کی آواز کو اگر ہم کٹھا کر لیں آپ دیکھیں کہ جوڈیشری کو جب ریسٹور ہم نے کیا تھا تو کس چیز نے ریسٹور کیا تھا عوام باہر نکل آئی تھی ایک عوامی آواز تھی ایک عوامی خواہش تھی وہ ایک عوامی ڈیمانڈ تھی تو جب عوام ڈیمانڈ کر لے گی اپنے راستے یا ہمیں یہ چاہیے یا یہ ہمارے لئے غلط ہے یا یہ آپ کو کرنا ہے تو پھر گورنمنٹ ہماری سنے گی لیکن ہماری آواز ہی کوئی نہیں ہے تو وہ پھر جو مرضی کریں گے تو ضروری یہ ہے کہ ہم اس آواز کو مضبوط کریں اور ایک کریں ایک یونیفائیڈ آواز ہو اور اس یونیفائیڈ آواز کی ضرورت اس وقت کیا ہے یہ جو عورتیں اور بچے ہیں اب آپ دیکھیں کہ what has America done to the women in the last 10, 11 years, 11 years of war? They have shown them that you can be free. They have shown them you can go to schools and colleges, you can go on television, you can sing, you can take off your burqa. Well, what's going to happen now? Have they come out on a vocation for this long? Are they going to now go back? Because they're going to be made to go back. Once the Allied forces and once the Americans have gone, it is quite apparent that the Taliban are again going to be ruling. It is quite, it, it is apparent, it is inevitable that they, they will have a great hold. <coughs> so what are they going to do to those women? What did, what did this great, this country, not only America, but even Europe, the Allied forces, from whom we've learned human rights, women's rights, we've learned from them. They are our teachers in this. But what did they do there? There was nothing. And now I think the biggest women's right violation is going to be when they go back and those women are left to the kind of rule and the kind of men that they're going to be living under. Those 
liberties are going to be taken back from them. So I think it's, a, you know, there was no long-term vision. It was very short-sighted. It was just until they were there. A decade hasn't changed an entire, uh, uh, you know, um, culture or society or... Since forever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think that the, a lot of damage has been done already. I think the women and the children are going to be going through huge suffering in Afghanistan, but coming to Pakistan. Uh, Quite possible. Yes. Uh, this, uh, I have a last question. This is Atif Siddiqui, patient of social entrepreneurship. I have been grown in the philosophy of happiness is the result of an event. But nowadays, contemporary healers are asking that happiness is also a drive. But how could we uh, attempt to realize this thing that happiness is a drive in our behavior? I didn't understand. Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't understand what you said. <coughs> you it? That's it. Okay. Can you hold it closer? I okay. think it I have been grown up in the philosophy of happiness as a result of an event. But nowadays, contemporary healers are asking that happiness is also a drive. But how could we attempt to realize that happiness is a drive in our behavior? That is my question. <laughs> Philosophic. <laughs> yes, philosophical. I think that um, happiness is a state of mind for those who believe, who believe deeply that the only way to show gratitude to the Almighty, the only practical way to show gratitude or the only translation or interpretation of shukar alhamdulillah is to be happy. It's the only practical expression of gratitude. It's the only practical expression. Ladies and gentlemen, all good things must come to an end. Mike, please. All good things must come to an end. Mike, Mike, and Mike, unfortunately, Mike. we have to end now. Okay. And thank you very much, every single person who's made this event possible. Who thank made you. it such a big success. And maybe come back next year in a bigger and a better way.